Hello, my name is Michael Smith, and I'm currently translating the alliterative Mort Arthur, King Arthur's Death, for Unbound. In this short film, I want to talk about siege warfare, because in the alliterative Mort Arthur, it is discussed in all its gory details. But quite how did siege warfare come about? If we look at the 14th century, and in particular the Hundred Years' War, we can see that English armies in France exercised power by a process known as the chevauchée, loosely translated as a promenade of horses, but in fact often a large army of five or even six or ten thousand men marching with abandon across the French countryside. Chevauchées could be royal armies, they could be armies of knights or princes, they could even be armies of mercenaries, the original freelancers. There were three main ways to combat a chevauchée. Firstly, open battle, as in the case of the Battle of Cressy in 1346. Secondly, the defending population could choose to adopt a scorched earth policy, denying the chevauchée food and supplies. Such an approach was used against Henry V in 1415, prior to the Battle of Agincourt. A third approach was to retire to a castle or fortified town or city and hide behind the walls. This was to invite the chevauchée to besiege the city. This happened at Caen and at Calais in 1346 it also happened most notoriously in 1370 at the siege of Limoges by the Black Prince. A siege was a high risk strategy, certainly for the defenders, but also for the besiegers themselves. For the besieging army, it tied up men, material and money and could take a long time indeed. Whereas the Siege of Caen lasted a matter of days, the Siege of Calais lasted almost a year. There were other risks too. Sometimes a besieging army could be caught between the walls and a defending army come from elsewhere. Or, as happened to Richard the Lionheart at Chalos in 1199, he was struck by a crossbow bolt and subsequently died. And for the defenders, well, life wasn't that pleasant either. Of course, one might feel safe behind the walls of a city or town, or in the confines of a castle or a keep. But as time went by, food began to run out. At Calais, as the siege drifted on, so those too weak to defend themselves and be of any use to the defenders were thrown out of the city, and there they were left to languish between the city walls and the encircling English army. Yet if these horrors alone weren't enough, for those who chose to fight to the end, eventually the wrath of the besiegers could become intense, violent and extremely destructive. At Caen in 1346, despite the brevity of the siege, over 3,000 people are said to have been slaughtered. At the Siege of Limoges in 1370, Foissart reports that 3,000 people here were slaughtered too. And although we think now that the numbers were much lower, it is clearly the nature of the slaughter which commanded his attention. And I think that this has had a bearing on the alliterative Mort Arthur. For in his description of the Siege of Metz, the Arthur poet hints at atrocities and barbarity which we can now only imagine. So let's take a look now at the Siege of Metz in the alliterative Mort Arthur. And what's really interesting, I think, is this. Although the poet describes events in the manner of the action of the poem itself, he makes allusions which we might think have historical references. For example, in contrast to, say, Richard the Lionheart, 
outside Chalou, who was killed by a crossbow bolt. Not so here with King Arthur. He rides almost armourless, in range of the defending archers, yet he is not afraid. He is a bold, conquering king of almost unrestrained arrogance and defiance. The king fakers further on a fairer steeder, with fairer and fair onta, and other four connectors. About the city they sewen, they socked her at the next, to seek them a second place to set her with enginess. Then uh, they bennied in burger boas of visa, beckers at the bolder kinga, with boosters lattice, all blasters at Arthur eagerly shot us, for to hurt him or his horse with that hard weapon. The king shunt her for no shot, nay no shield askes, but shows him sharply in his sheeny weeders, langers all at leisure, and lookers on the wallers where they were lowest the leaders to a sailor. Sir, said Sir Ferreira, a folly thou were workers, Thus knackered in the noble to nigh to the wallers, singly in thy circuit, this city to reach her, and show thee where they never to shend us all. Hie us hastily, hen, or we mon full happen, for hit they thee or the horse, it harm us for ever. <laughs> if thou be feared, quod the king, I read it thou read utter, lest that they rue thee with their round weapon. Thou art a but a fond king, nor fairly me thinkest. Thou wilt be flayed for a fly that on thy flesh lictus. I am nothing, Agasta, so me God a helper. Though such gadlings be grieved, it grieves me but little. Let's take a look now at how the Arthur poet describes the siege of Metz, and we'll begin here when the army arrives on the outskirts of the city. This brings to mind the Black Prince's attack at Carcassonne in 1355, when he attacked the suburbs there, but the rest of the defenders remained in the city. And I think you know, that's quite a telling reference, because that happens here in the Mort Arthur, although, of course, with different consequences. Then the priestmen prekers, and provers their horses, Sattles to the city upon the Sierra Hathas, and circus the suburbs, sadly thereafter, discoveries of shot men and skirmish a little. Scare is their scotifers and their scout watches, Britons their barrows with their abricto weapons, beat a down a barbican and the bridge winnis. Ne had the garnison been good at the great getters. They had won that won by their own strength. Then withdraws our men, and dresses them better, for dread of the drawbridge dashed in Sondere. Here's to the herbigage, there the king hovis, with his battle on hay, horsed on steedis. Then was the prince pervade, and their places Norman, picked up pavilions of Paula, and platters in siege. So let's now look at the siege itself. The Arthur poet pulls no punches here. He shows, illustrates the destruction of a city by an enraged king and his army. This is what medieval inhabitants themselves would have had to have suffered. The king then to a sorter, he assembled his, his connectors, with Soma Castell and Sow upon Sarah Hathas, Skifties his Scotty fairies, and scales the wallers, and each a watch has his warder with wees a men of armors. Then boldly they busk, and bend his engines, paises in pilots, and provers their castes. Minsteries and mass they maul to the earth, churches and chapels, chalk wheat blanched. Stone steeples full stiff in the street leagues, chambers with chimneys and many chief inners paced and paled down plastered walls. The pain of the purple 
was petty for to hear. Although here we've seen the city being attacked, I want to draw your attention now into this small excerpt which describes how the inhabitants fled from Metz itself. This is interesting because it, it really conveys what was going on in those times. People knew that if they stayed in such a city, they would have been killed or raped or maimed or burned to death or some other horrific end. And so in these few lines, we get a sense of the real horror in medieval warfare. There is no romance here. Thou fleed at the fair agata, folk are without in number, for fear of Sir Florent and his fiercer connectors. Void is the city, and to the ward rinise, with vetel and vessel and vestor so richer, they busk up a banner a bound of the broad agatas. Of Sir Florent, in face so fain was he never, the connector hove on a hill, beheld it to the wallies, and said, I see beyond senior, the city is ours. It's interesting, isn't it, that for many medieval chroniclers, judgment was not really being passed on kings. Sieges were seen as a way of life. Kings were religious. They committed acts, yet believed in the will of God and that God was on their side. But in the alliterative Mort Arthur, I think something else is going on. I think the poet is writing in a critical manner. He is not approving of these acts or deeds. He's almost saying that King Arthur, this great apogee of chivalry, in whom the Black Prince and Edward III all believed, he in fact is the face of the monstrosity of man. I do hope you've enjoyed this brief film. If you've not yet supported my translation of King Arthur's death, the alliterative Mort Arthur, and you'd like to do so, please follow the link elsewhere on this page. Equally, you might be interested in my translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, also published with Unbound. It's packed with historical information and also a range of my liner cut prints, one of which you can see behind me here, of the Green Knight himself. Thanks once again for watching.